Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation, Alexander Konovalov. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee of the 4th St. Petersburg International Legal Forum, allow me to welcome all the participants here at the concluding plenary session of the forum. This year, we have changed the sequence of events at the legal forum, the plenary session that traditionally opened our deliberations. Uh, this time, this year, concludes the two days of the forum. At this point of time, we are already confident that uh, this change in sequence has not affected negatively the quality of the discussions that we have seen over the past two days. The fourth legal forum has uh, set a number of important records, uh, beating some of the achievements of last year as we had a record number of participants here, a record number of foreign delegates as well as uh, foreign delegations. We have seen a record number of representatives of uh, foreign corporate jurisprudence. And finally, this time, the forum has offered its guests over 50 discussion venues, uh, which focused on a number of highly important, uh, highly specific matters relating to the application of law. We are delighted uh, that uh, we have beat these records, not only for the sake of the records alone, but we have created very favorable pre prerequisites uh, in order to achieve the most important goal of this forum, to ensure a high level, high quality discussion around the topics uh, that were selected uh, for the forum's agenda on a very practical level on the one hand, and also to discuss um, some of the most important uh, cross-cutting topic, topics this year. Uh, it is the rule of law. This year, uh, a number of uh, important dates are surrounding this forum, especially for Russian expert, legal experts and jurists. Uh, recently, we uh, celebrated 20 years of uh, the um, Russian Constitution. The Alexander II's uh, famous statute has been celebrated. It's 50, 150 years. And the uh, famous uh, charter of the UK is being celebrated these days as well. Every such document reflected its era, its realities, and uh, its approaches. But every such document has always aimed to establish the rule of law. And now, as we're looking back at our experiences, uh, as we take into account the realities of today, I think we need to answer a number of very important questions, uh, some of which are of global nature. Today, the rule of law is uh, very often viewed as a sac sacred concept by many, and perhaps this is the right attitude. At the same time, every uh, jurist and every lawyer, every manager of law practice needs to answer a number of uh, wide-ranging questions here. For instance, uh, what do we use? Uh, what do we protect when we practice law? Do we protect legitimate interests, or are we aiming to protect interests that may not be legitimate? How do we understand the rule of law? In practice, are we talking about a high standard for regulating legal relations, or do we sometimes risk uh, uh, double standards? And how adequate are the mechanisms uh, uh, that are used uh, to regulate um, these uh, attempts at answering these questions candidly have uh, brought us much closer to a more adequate understanding of the rule of law, of how law can be applied, and it has created prerequisites for enhanced future dialogue on this topic. Uh, and it is exactly this that uh, uh, the St. Petersburg Legal Forum will continue to focus on every year. I thank you very much, and I wish you successful conclusion of your work at the forum. Ladies and 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now inviting to the stage the plenary speakers of the fourth St. Petersburg International Legal Forum. Mr. Julio Cesar Alak, the Minister of Justice and Human Rights of the Republic of Argentina. Christoph Bernasconi, Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Michel Grimaldi, Professor of the Law School of the Pantheon Assas University. Rajendra Madlokha, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India. Peter Maura, President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Plenary Session Moderator, Nikolai Kropachev, Doctor of Legal Sciences, Rector of the St. Petersburg State University, and also a Bureau Member of the Presidium of the Association of Russian Lawyers. And finally, Chairman of the Government of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Anatolyevich Medvedev. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me to welcome all of you in St. Petersburg, to welcome all our guests, those who were here before and those who have come for the first time. This forum is hosted by our city for the fourth time. About 2,000 of our colleagues, professional lawyers, participate in it. And this proves that the forum has become a universal platform for meetings, discussions, and communication. I have com com discussed some issues with my colleagues before the plenary. Everything's good except the weather, but the weather is as it is in St. Petersburg. They told me that yesterday it was better. Well, I haven't noticed that. But this is the way our city is. It's beautiful in rain and not in rain. Currently we have these white nights. I hope that all of you had an opportunity to see at least something and to visit some sites in our second capital, St. Petersburg. Well, and the format of our communication allows us to exchange opinion and have discussions on different matters. It unites us in our understanding of the basic moments. It shows our adherence to the rule of law principle and shows that the law is the most civilized, the clearest, and the most humane way to resolve problems and conflicts. Well, there are a lot of occasions for disputes within the lawyer community. Our profession was created some time ago for this, to resolve disputes. And here, at this forum, different issues and matters were mentioned. I will mention some more, which I believe, I personally believe, to be very important and noteworthy. Which of them? First, how the international law will develop in the 21st century when the role of supranational associations is growing year by year. Where could a 
borrowing of legal institutions from the other countries' practice lead us all. I know that you've discussed over these matters, but they remain topical. Where are the limits of the national sovereignty and the national legal system. And as a manifestation, which is a topical issue for a lot of large economies, where are the limits for the national taxation for transnational companies? Are the non-jurisdictional forms to protect the rights of business people well elaborated? And I say nothing about such popular topics, not only for legal people, topics like the role of the WTO in the world economy and in the legal practice, or about the new rules of the IP protection, which are being born in front of us with the growing of the internet technologies. I will dwell on those issues and some other issues a bit later, but now I'd like to say that in our heated discussions we should not lose the main goal of our forum. In the recent years we have been witnessing the attempts to solve almost any conflict by the most simple way, which is the non-legal way, to say simpler, by force. Sometimes it is done open with the help of arms, sometimes it is done with the help of the so-called soft power, including various sanctions. In this context, the legal community bears, I believe, a special responsibility. Legal ways to resolve disputes should not only be maintained, but they should be returned and introduced into the very essence and core of the policy and the civil ethics. That is why all of us have a difficult and important mission to protect the law itself. And judging by how tense your discussions have been at your roundtables and the panels during the previous two days, I believe that all the participants of this forum understand this mission. Allow me as a representative of the hosting side to thank you for your active participation in these discussions. The topic of this, of this plenary is the concept of rule of law in legal systems, key takeaways and future prospects. That is an announcement of the end of the whole age. I'd like to clarify my view. I believe that there is no alternative to legal principles which have become the basis and backbone for every modern state, because those legal principles are the essence of human experience. However, the role and the meaning of law for state is not, does not remain unchanged. In the recent years, we have been witnessing the transformation of the role of law in the life of society, in the economy, in the international relations. We are witnessing a dilution of dilution of the structure of law. There are no more limits between material and procedural law, but also between the public and private law. This border seemed unshakable to us since Ulpian. Of course, the influence of public law over private law is growing. However, the universally recognized principles and norms remain unchanged of the international law. It would not be acceptable to reconsider the notion of the main principles because we do not have anything else. That's the simple reason. The humanity has not developed anything better for all its history. And this, this reconsideration would destroy the structure of the international law, modern international law, and the international relations. The cases of the departure from imperative norms, which are being practiced by separate states, testify of the violation of the norms, but they do not mean the cancellation of norms. On the contrary, they must instigate our states to search for additional means to obey the norms. 
because law has no alternative as an instrument of the inter-government dialogue. It is second to none. Of course, in the, in the international law, there have been cases when separate norms were going away because they were contradicting the interests of the international community and the level of development of humanity itself. For example, the states have re dropped the right to war. On the result of this World War II, the main international legal document of the modern times have been, has been created, that is the UN Charter, which has enshrined the legal principles in it and made them the cornerstone. We'd li I'd like also to note that there is another trend which is visible today. The same international legal norm is understood and interpreted by different states or groups of states in a different way, and sometimes in an opposite way even. It is possible in itself, I think, but this is leading to the fact that there is a separate understanding of the international law formed in a separate state, and the state goes along it. Or there may be another situation when the state goes into another extreme. It spreads its jurisdiction to other countries and tries to bring to responsibility all the foreign individuals and entities, thus undermining the state sovereignty doctrine and the international law principles and norms. That is why modernization of the modern international law and unification of their interpretation remains topical on the table. Currently, no legal system can exist in isolation and no country managed to build effective and competitive legislation norm from scratch, system from scratch. However, when we assess the borrowing of legal institute from outside practice, we may say that this borrowing is not always effective. It can be effective only if the new mechanism corresponds to the principles of the national system and the legal, consci uh, legal consciousness of the lawyers, the judges, and, of course, all other lawyers who influence the legal practice. And, of course, if it... If it coincides with the law, uh, legal mind of ordinary people. Lawyers are conservative people due to their profession, and they treat large-scale novels in legislation with concern. However, any changes are new professional opportunities and capabilities. In this country, we have some changes as well, but it, is, it does not mean that all the changes are favorable. For example, in front of us, for the recent several months, there have been new directions for developing the legal areas in this country. We have dem the demand of the inter public international law and the private international law, including thanks to the sanctions that were recently imposed against any common sense and against any international norms on the Russian citizens and companies. That is a bad occasion, but the lawyers are practicing their skills in this area. By the way, in the recent times, I do not remember the fact and I have to say that I have signed a lot of documents, a lot of decrees of the government and laws, etc. But in the recent times, I have signed a lot of governmental decrees to hire legal companies to protect the legal interests of our country. I do not know whether it is good or bad, but some lawyers have received a job. And there are good occasions as well. For example, long-term opportunities for using law are opened in new legal regimes, for example, the faster growth territories, which are being created in this country, in Siberia, in the Far East, 
So the legal matter is being is developing, and in this or that way we are influencing that. We have to. We are modernizing the private law in this country. We have introduced broad changes to the legislation. In, for example, the bail, the deals, the corporate law. There is a new legal mechanism for government procurement, and we are finalizing the civil code now. We've been trying to use really heated discussions to balance some legal constructs which were different in origin. And some of those constructs actually are not, do not coincide with our system. They are different. For example, the notions uh, of corporate agreements, etc. A lot of legal institutions included into the civil legislation have been brought to life by the court practice. We have, we are actively uniting our high courts. Supreme Courts, although any unification must be gradual, go stage by stage, not to break the existing mechanisms, we are developing the international ties law, I mean the marine law, the sea law, the air law, the trade law, etc. We need to unify the relations which did not used to be regulated. We just have to remember the e-trading and e-transactions. We are unifying the law in the inter-government integration associations, such as the customs union and the single economic space. We should remember that we might borrow the legal experience not only in the systems of countries who are aggressively exporting their law, but also from other supranational legal systems. We are witnessing their development in our cooperation with our partners in the Customs Union and the Eurasian Economic Union, in the SCO, in our co current cooperation between the BRICS states and in a number of other international organizations which are very important for our modern development. Distinguished colleagues, the long-term economic policy of the state is impossible without the high-quality legal regulation of foreign investments. However, in the recent decades, all the countries have to think over their taxation strategies scrupulously and take into account the large transnational investments coming to their markets. That means that the national tax potential problem becomes more relevant. And it's quite difficult to spread the tax sovereignty on the income sources of the transnational companies which are in other tax jurisdictions. There is no separate criterion for intrusion into the fiscal territory of a state. Our recent measures in the taxation legislation have been aimed at effectively using legal mechanisms which allow to implement the actual sovereignty in the taxation area. All the countries are doing that. I have to say that's a difficult issue, and that is why I'm mentioning it. It, it all began in the 1960s. The U.S. were the first to deal with it because it was the largest economy in the world. But the most active work have begun after we have entered in the financial crisis of 2008. And we are doing this as well. The day before yesterday, I've discussed with business representatives a special law about the changes in the tax code of Russia elaborated by the Minister of Finance, where we have now new notions introduced, like a beneficiary, o beneficiary owner, the controlled foreign company, 
which is which has the abbreviation of CFC. We are introducing the notion of controlling body. We have the notion of tax resident. We have the new obligation to pay a profit tax of the controlled comp by the controlled company. And we suggest that the controlled companies, should, the CFCs, should include the foreign companies or structures which are controlled in the, by the in the residents in Russia by the residents in Russia, and which are in taxation jurisdiction with the most favored nation regime. We know how often the national companies, covering with this corporate veil, are acting as as a foreign investor and having disputes in the states in getting these or those advantages. And this trend is an external manifestation of an offshoreization of the national business. And I'd like to be frank, that's not always evil. But it is evident that such trend takes away a lot of taxes from the government and state. So all the countries are taking measures to return their businesses in their national jurisdictions, but that should be done carefully and smartly, because even the strongest countries and powers cannot achieve financial transparency and return the companies into their financial jurisdiction without open and mutually beneficial cooperation, without the dialogue between the states, without the dialogue between the regulators and business. And without all those, such measures could have an opposite result. They could destroy the financial system. They could result in the outflow of the companies from the economy to lower competitiveness, to change of citizenship by individuals. So we have to be balanced in our actions. On our side, we are creating effective and efficient investor protection mechanisms, including the so-called non-jurisdiction forms. These are direct negotiations, mediation, arbitrage. For the recent 20 years, the Russian legislators have been trying to include all the basic mechanisms into our national legislation, although the work is not yet finalized. The international commercial arbitrage has proved its efficiency for solving investment disputes. We are meaning the arbitrage are at the Chamber of Commerce in Stockholm, the tertiary court in, at the International Chamber of Commerce, our international commercial arbitrage court at the Chamber of Commerce of the Russian Federation. And these bodies take investment disputes to their consideration as well, including the European Court on Human Rights. Well, we have a lot of disputes now, and the practice, I believe, will be accumulating because in the near future we will have a part of disputes between the Russian companies and Ukrainian companies which will give us additional occasions for discussions. And in any way, I'd like to say that such arbitrage court proceedings are an alternative to use of force and to neglecting the law. It's better to meet in courts than solve those disputes in an, another way. It is very important to have the utmost transparency of jurisdiction procedures to protect the, the investors' rights. One of such mechanisms of ensuring transparency is a clearer adherence to rules and norms of the WTO. And the WTO is forming new trends in the international policy and trade already. Our country has been in the WTO for, the two, for two years. Before that, we have been knocking at the doors of the organization for two decades. And a lot of measures of the Russian industrial policy, as the practice shows, create concerns 
within our trade partners. We have similar claims to them, in particular to our European colleagues, and I believe that we have to work together in order to create a more transparent and balanced system of rules, in which would take into account all our mutual concerns and we should resolve all the economic disputes only within the WTO procedures. She has been consistently implementing its obligations, which it assumed when joining the WTO. They uh, refer to decreasing import taxes rates and duties quotas and removing administrative barriers, reform of legislation and public administration system. Now we should solve the task of harmonization of WTO norms and norms of those integration associations which we have created at the Eurasian space. They include technical regulations, the differences in which can give rise to many obstacles in international trade and become technical barriers, which the WTO agreement is aimed to overcome. We understand this and we are working intensively on removing such contradictions. Moreover, collisions between acts and decisions can arise not only in the technical regulation sphere, but also it is much more dangerous to initiate uh, legal collisions, international legal collisions. It is uh, quite an unfavorable topic, but we have a frank discussion. And I would like to say it here among my colleagues, lawyers from different countries, I'm talking about notorious sanctions. And I would like to remind you that unilateral, politically motivated sanctions are not legitimate from the point of view of classic international law. They are not based on international law. They do not correspond public order, first of all, because they ignore the mechanisms of the application of enforcement measures established by the UN Charter. And it was our position in all the cases when such Unilateral sanctions were used without any agreement with the United Nations, including Iraq, Syria, and other states. And these concerns, those sanctions which they are trying to introduce against us, we believe their legal component, the international legal component, is equal to a nil. And, and that's what I'm. I'm talking about the illegal limitation of legitimate interests of member states of WTO, of course, gives them a right to use mechanisms of this organization for their protection and insist on considering these disputes in the dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization. Here, a number of problems arise uh, with regard to our membership in the Customs Union and Euro Eurasian Economic Union because a number of decisions are being made at super national level and supranational body decisions are necessary for these. And even if we win a dispute in the dispute settlement body of the WTO, it does not provide for our total victory. So we need to find our own mechanisms in order not to violate the obligations assumed by us before. There is another problem when the United States introduced sanctions against Russia, which create negative consequences for international trade. We have decided to contest these sanctions in the World Trade Organization in the dispute settlement body, although we understand it is not going to be easy because the United States has uh, a doctrinal and practical authority in the, in the WTO. It is a state which is a leader in initiating trade disputes in the WTO. But I believe that if such a mechanism is provided, we should apply it. All the participants of the World Trade Organization should use it. If we are talking about this situation, then we are suffering damage from restrictions. And that is why we need to protect our interest. We have sent a communicate to the WTO on non-implementation of the United States of its commercial obligations. I believe it is a, a normal practice. It is absolutely civilized. And that is how we should settle our disputes. Moreover, such sanctions violate the rules of the World Trade Organization including 
the most favored nation regime in trade because they demonstrate discrimination to the suppliers of services from other countries. They violate the direct prohibition of the second article of the general agreement on trade in services and obligations of the WTO on the trade of specific financial services. If we are talking about the restrictions which were introduced towards a number of Russian banks, the question is whether the WTO will accept the version of the justification of the sanctions of the USA, but we'll have an opportunity to assess the, whether this body is unbiased and impartial in settling disputes. There are also other reasons to settle such disputes in courts, and I'm talking about it right here and emphasizing that I believe that such way of settling disputes between states is the most civilized. Such way can give us results, and it should be based on authority of the organization which makes the final decision. Dear colleagues, there is a number of industries of law where new opportunities and decisions arise every year, and I would like to give a few words about the development of legislation on intellectual property. In the recent years, it has become very popular, the point of view on total liberalization of regulation in this branch of law. I believe that balanced approach is much more justified. Otherwise, many high-tech industries which require expensive equipment and well-paid specialists will become non-competitive and won't be able to develop. I believe that legislation on intellectual property should improve in several directions. What are these directions? First of all, we should provide such protection of these intellectual rights which does not impede creativity. It's obvious today. From technological point of view, today's society can't do without borrowing. So we should regulate the legal regime more thoroughly. Otherwise, business will continue protecting innovations only with the help of confidentiality agreements. And this often impedes public access to new technologic information. Second, it is necessary to fight against counterfeit products such products have become a national and international threat. Moreover, imperfect legislation, although legislation can never be perfect, including Russian legislation, so it impedes access of foreign investors, and we are fully aware of it, and our legislation is developing. But it's an international task, and I've mentioned it for many times in my discussions with colleagues, heads of states and governments. We need to create new conventions on intellectual actual property, but I haven't seen any willingness among my colleagues to do this. And the thought, it is necessary to improve international patent regulation. In the past, patents were conceived as a barrier for competitors. Today, they are a means to protect and spread knowledge. However, differences in national legal norms on, int on intellectual property impede joint projects in business, the time it's high time to create universal models and national national patent agencies should try to establish close cooperation with agencies in other countries. We should use unified databases for patentable subjects to speed up the application processing. And of course we need a unified format of application for patent and we should be able to pass this information by email. Dear colleagues, law has always been a key institute of social and economic development throughout the human history. Economy can't be efficient without efficient law. And without efficient economy, we can't have public stability. That is why law is necessary for normal public life. The law is valuable because it can maintain in the long-term perspective stable development of public relations. 
where law does not act, there is no stability, and tragic events take place in those places. We can give an example of Middle East countries and in Ukraine right now. Solutions of most difficult problems of the states are only possible based on legal approaches use of application of international law principles and international dialogue. Lewis can't keep silent in the face of global changes and dramatic challenges of today. We can't simply yield to the increasing political pressure. We can't turn law into a cover for achieving sometimes improper goals. It is the general mission of our profession, and I've mentioned it before. And today, dialogue is important more than ever. It is important to have an atmosphere of confidence and trust. We need to work out new approaches and regulation principles which will provide, on the one hand, flexibility, adaptiveness of law, and on the second hand, its stability and predictability. And that is why we have invited you here today to St. Petersburg for Forum. And we are grateful to you for accepting our invitation. Some time ago, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote that even the strongest is never strong enough to be always the master unless he transforms strength into law. This is a very good idea. And in Russia, we have another idiom which almost any person in our country knows. This is a phrase from a famous movie. What is the power about? Power is about truth. But truth and law in Russian language are the words which have the same root. So for all of us, force is about law. Thank you. Dmitry Anatolievich, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, before we continue uh, with the forum subject, keeping in mind the ideas addressed by Dmitry Anatolievich, I'd like to make just a couple of comments, if I may. Today, uh, well, our speakers represent different legal professions. Some of them are heads of international organizations. Some others, uh, well, we are chief justice of the Supreme Court, the minister of justice. We have a representative of one of the uh, leading law schools of the world. That's why I'm quite confident that uh, we can expect exciting uh, presentations and wonderful discussions. One request for the speakers, if you feel you uh, want to make a comment about this or that presentation, please let me know, OK? Thank you. And now let us move over to the presentations. My dear colleagues, for the first time, uh, this forum has a representative of uh, South America in terms of social and economic development. Argentina is a leading uh, Latin American country. It is uh, a founder as a nation of Mercosur agreement on the southern common market. It is my pleasure to give the floor to the Minister of Justice and Human Rights of the Republic of Argentina, His Excellency Julio Cesar Alok, who is well known across the globe as a politician protecting people against arbitrary persecutions. He started out doing that as a journalist, and his contribution is well known across the world. And as an uncompromising fighter against crime, in including uh, real evil of the world, which is terrorism, of course. Now, uh, Mr. Minister, you have the floor. 
Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to Alexander Konovalov, Russia's Minister of Justice, for inviting me to participate in this very important fourth uh, legal forum. It's a really historic event. In terms of law development in the world, thank you very much for organizing the forum and for giving us a lot of attention. I would also like to give you a welcome from Dr. Cristina Fernanda Kishner, President of Argentina. Gratitude to uh, Prime Minister Medvedev and uh, President of Russia, Mr. Putin. Uh, let me give you her welcome and gratitude for close cooperation between our two nations. It is a great honor for me to come to Russia. Your country made a considerable contribution in arts, science, and culture in general. Let me also express uh, my delegation's uh, deep satisfaction and pleasure because we came, we had a chance to come to attend the false legal forum to beautiful city, monumental city of St. Petersburg, uh, with lots of uh, splendid palaces, uh, buildings, avenues, rivers, and canals, which witnessed some very serious events over the last three centuries. Dear ministers, chief justices, lawyers, distinguished participants, thank you very much for your participation. It is really an honor for me to be here. Politics and law are two different areas. They're quite autonomous, independent of each other. And that's uh, the idea. Of course, politics should rely and depend on law, but law should be independent of politics. However, reality and practical experience tells us otherwise. Since the modern state was created three centuries ago, politics and law have been interconnected and indivisible. The concept of uh, rule of law state, uh, which is popular today, relies on the necessity to take care of social conflicts, alleviate social conflicts, alleviate uh, the results of the fight for power, and create foundation for common sense planning. Uh, law decides on the conditions for political activities. That's why politics, which actually a way for people to express their will, um, have to uh, help law realize its tasks. The general rules our society lives by are all about law. Law does not only make uh, power legitimate. Uh, moreover, power, uh, law comes through human life before a person is born and doesn't leave a human life after a person dies. Law organizes, systemizes, makes systemic and brings meaning into relations among people. Law defines uh, biological structures of society, natural structures of society. Let me take it back like the structure of family, children's legal status. Uh, make some unions legitimate and others illegal. And so uh, you can see manifestations of law in every aspect of human life. That's why legal knowledge is strategically important. What I'm trying to say is that uh, politics are based on the foundation created by law. Law should therefore be flexible enough to be able to adjust to the changes brought about by political activities. Stable and sustainable changes are impossible unless they fit in the life of a rule of law state, unless they are supported by the political goodwill. And uh, consequently, therefore, we have to realize that wars and casualties of the past century 
were brought about by illegitimate policies which resulted in uh, tragedies of civilization. International organizations and legal uh, structures which came to life after World War II defined the development of human rights on the global level and created a new international law order in, in um, a situation of two different poles, bipolar world. But as uh, we approach the end of the uh, first 10 years of the 21st century, we realize that we cannot sustain or maintain peace in a world with just one superpower, conflicts and response to conflicts show that uh, we want to have a multipolar scenario, develop such a scenario. And that is not limited to uh, multipolar nations. That includes various organizations, coalitions, and transnational global corporations. The fruit of neoliberal paradigm that reigned in the world across many dozens of years Yes, it resulted in the government which was losing sovereignty, losing it to specific facts of life. Politics um, were behind private interests, and very often those private interests ran counter and to public interests and were used as a tool to maintain the status quo. That was a self destructible, self-destructive dynamic, uh, and that was characterized by fast turnover of goods, people, and information in the world, no matter where you are. In the world today, we are just witnesses uh, who witness what's going on in different corners of the planet. We're not participants, and uh, we're not eyewitnesses. We can't be eyewitnesses. And if you lose one international system, and you have a new international system, such dynamic can give you uncertainty. But crisis also brings about new opportunities which we just can't miss. The same can be said about international relations, politics, economics. Uh, bring new phenomena to us, and uh, that is the process we have to use in our legal cooperation realm. It is necessary to make politics play a transforming leading role once again so that all layers, all strata of society could regain uh, its fundamental rights. That puts a lot of responsibility on us in terms of how we should relate to each other and how we should meet uh, various needs in how we should develop uh, elements of the rule of law state and how we should practice law. We should implement the mechanisms and tools that are available to us already, create new mechanisms to develop knowledge about acts, uh, rights, uh, and obligations, and we have to do it hand in hand with our people, with our general public since the Constitution was adopted in my country more than 100 years ago. We have developed uh, more than 34,000 of different laws, bills, and implementing regulations. After university experts reviewed them in a lot of detail, they concluded that only uh, 3,400 are active out of them. 1,400 regulate international law, both public and uh, private. That goes for Argentina and other Mercosur countries. So uh, what you have at the end of the day is 10 percent of the existing laws uh, which are really working. This kind of legal inflation creates uncertainty and limits knowledge about laws in society. Well, Hegel used to say, he said, that democratic laws mean nothing if they are taken away from actual life of society. You want more synthesis. You want to avoid a situation where only 10% of the existing laws are working. 
In the case of Argentina, we feel we have to develop domestic legislation to make every law work. Even though, if, even if we have fewer laws, we must have broader access to laws without access to justice, without access to the judicial system, to courts. Your laws are not working. And new uh, tools, new instruments such as internet help us, may help us streamline the process of improving the access. One politician of Argentina used to say that uh, you want to try to achieve a situation where freedom and justice develop a causal relationship. So we want to create more free of charge channels disseminating legal knowledge, help our experts share their knowledge with others so that they could get down to resolving practical issues. We can't work away from social policy. We should set specific political goals. Without them, it will be impossible to resolve legal tasks. The change of times, and we're living in the change of times, uh, leads to recodification, revision of older laws, creation of new laws, streamlining controversial laws, laws that people don't quite understand. There is another objective. Legal objective, of course, and that is to do all we can to make courts function appropriately, to make them work to meet people's needs. It, 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 it is not enough to develop a law. You want to have the system of law which serves the people. You want to use it as a tool to implement the strategy which will bring us into the future. And finally, let me make this comment to all legal professionals. It is our responsibility to use existing resources in our professional life. That's task number one. That's the biggest political challenge. That is what our work is about. If we realize what social changes are, if we understand what social changes are taking place now, if we make them serve the cause of freedom and, and social benefits, then we'll be able to resolve the tasks facing us and be based on politics as we do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Alak. In spite of very significant efforts undertaken by the international community in order to establish effective mechanisms of intergovernmental relations, various international conflicts, sometimes acute conflicts, unfortunately take place. And today we have an opportunity to learn what is the recipe, how to solve these problems. In the opinion of the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, this organization was set up in 1863, and since then it has been providing not only humanitarian assistance to people of the world, but it has been very effective in disseminating knowledge on uh, laws and principles uh, of international humanitarian law. Mr. Peter Maurer will tell us today what he thinks about the rule of law in the settlement of international conflicts. You have the floor, Mr. Maurer. Prime Minister, uh, Minister of Justice, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I am a bad dancer and even a worse singer, I have no alternative in this wonderful theater than to talk. So thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, that you offer me today. Dear colleagues, for centuries, international law has regulated interactions among sovereign states, notably to maintain a basic international order without affecting and duly their domestic legal sphere. In this context, ensuring the rule of law has essentially been a procedural matter left to the discretion of states whose application of international treaty and customary law in good faith was presumed. International law was thus predicated upon the commitment of each and every state to implement international rules in their own domestic legal orders. 
Modern international humanitarian law emerged exactly 150 years ago with the first Geneva Convention in the context of this traditional legal culture, continuing on the national implementation capabilities to respect and ensure respect, to quote the famous Article 1 common to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. However, the concept of the rule of law has now considerably expanded and gained prominence in the international sphere. This evolution has been the result of the link evident since the adoption of the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights between the stability of international legal order on the one hand and the respect of the law, order and human values at the domestic level on the other hand. From a procedural approach relying on the sovereignty and discretion of states, the rule of law concept became much more substantive, allowing international rules, standards and values to transform not only the legal framework, but also state institutions and as a consequence the face of the international community itself. There are thus two functions of the rule of law that are sometimes in tension with each other. On the one hand, the rule of law has a regulatory function aiming notably at implementing international rules and standards in the context of an already existing domestic legal framework. On the other hand, it has at times a more ambitious transformative function, supposing the necessity to apply changes in legal and institutional frameworks in order to ensure respect for the law and human values, which have much more aspirational perspectives and transcend minimal consensus of states. Through its action, the International Committee of the Red Cross is at the center of this tension inherent in the concept of the rule of law between pure implementation and the transformation of international humanitarian law. On the one hand, the work of the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, is predicated upon a classical approach of international law centered on sovereign states which have ratified IHL treaties and which are as a consequence under the obligation to implement those rules. The ICRC, as the promoter of IHL, often adopts a positivist approach, recalling the law as it stands and working with states towards the implementation and its respect. On the other hand, by virtue of its humanitarian role, the ICRC endeavors to continuously improve the protection of victims in armed conflict. This might require identifying gaps and certainties in the law and to work with states to improve the cogency of the IHL legal framework with an aspirational goal in mind. The aim here is to transform the better the legal and operational environment and to constantly remind and influence the international community to put the needs of victims of armed conflicts at the center of all concerns. When Henri Dunant proposed in his famous book, A Memoir of Solferino, in 1862, to adopt a treaty protecting the wounded in the field, this historical initiative was profoundly transformative and aspirational. It prompted the adoption of the first ever multilateral treaty of the, for assistance and protection of the wounded and sick in the battlefield in 1864. The adoption of the now internationally recognized protective emblem of the Red Cross and the creation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement as the largest humanitarian network in the world, which changed the face of humanitarian action. In the same vein, on ICRC's initiative, IHL expanded to apply to civilian populations in international armed conflicts in 1949, and then to situations of non-international armed conflicts through the introduction of Article 3 common to the Geneva Conventions. This latest initiative led to a small revolution of the international system, whereby organized non-state armed groups became direct subjects of international law and holders of duties under international humanitarian law. This peculiarity of IHL remains today one of the important strengths of international humanitarian law and leads to the essential complementarities with human rights law, which binds the jure only states. Regarding the first role of the ICRC to encourage states to implement international humanitarian law as it stands, an important part of our work is based on a classical and positivist approach of the law. 
IHL is based on widely ratified treaties and customary law. However, even strong laws may remain dead letters without proper implementation. As a result of its work in armed conflict, the ICRC is convinced that clear domestic legal frameworks that are known by the competent authorities and consistent with international law, when properly implemented, are able to save lives and reduce suffering. We also help to develop technical expertise, model legislation, and to promote national capacity building designed to strengthen compliance with IHL, thus contributing to, to strengthen the rule of law at domestic level. At the request of national authorities and with their consent, the ICRC contributes in the areas which has, it has expertise due to its work and which are as diverse as prison reform, strengthening the judiciary, and training civil servants, armed and security forces. In this endeavor, we always take into account and integrate local legal and institutional traditions as this is key to our success. In order to ensure implementation of international humanitarian law, the ICRC conducts what we call protection activities. ICRC delegates, having documented uh, violations, for instance, ill-treatment of detainees or direct attacks against civilian persons, make confidential representations to the authorities and inform them of the existence of these protection problems. Moving to the second role of the ICRC, the IC strengthening the rule of law in its more ambitious sense, the ICRC keeps in mind that the objective of this body of law is to adequately protect victims of contemporary armed conflict. In this context, we endeavor to interpret IHL in a strict but also dynamic and theological manner. We hear too often that IHL is an old body of law unable to regulate new means of warfare, such as drones or autonomous weapons, or to apply to potentially new warfighting domains, such as cyber warfare or major secret operations. It is our strong belief that the rules and principles of IHL such as the principle of distinction, proportionality and precaution, or the prohibition of arms which uselessly ag aggravate the suffering of disabled men and women, remain entirely valid in these new areas. The 1949 conventions and additional protocols are not meant to apply to past conflicts. They provide for rules that are equally applicable to events, as well as means and method of warfare, which were unforeseen at the time of their adoption. At the same time, it is necessary to continuously assess together with states the potential need to clarify or adapt the law to cope with the challenges of today's world. Therefore, the ICRC has also accompanied and supported evolutions external to IHL, such as the development of international criminal law, which further strengthens the protection of victims of armed conflicts by putting in place a system of accountability. Today, the ICRC continues to working on strengthening the legal framework for victims in armed conflict. At the 31st International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent in 2011, Resolution 1 invited the ICRC to pursue further research and consultations and discussions in cooperation with states to identify and propose a range of options and recommendations for strengthening international humanitarian law in two areas, the protections of persons deprived of liberty in non-international armed conflicts and international humanitarian law compliance mechanisms. We sincerely hope that these initiatives will prove successful and thus contribute ultimately to better rule of law at the international level with stronger IHL rules and compliance mechanisms. Success in this endeavor is, however, impossible without the trust accorded by states and their political will to improve the protection afforded to victims of armed conflict. To conclude, we can say that even if there might sometimes be tensions, if even if there might sometimes be tensions, the two facets, facets of the rule of law reinforce each other as the dual role of ICRC shows. Because of our daily work rooted on positive law, 
We can identify gaps, uncertainties, lacks of clarities in interpretation of the law, which gives us the expertise and knowledge to act with an aspirational goal in mind in order to strengthen the protection afforded to victims in armed conflict. In parallel, the reality of our operational activities require us to work on evolutions of the law that are pragmatic and realistic, and that help transform the international community, but in a way that is acceptable for states who are the only actors having the faculty to develop the law. This work, worthy of an equilibrist, is different and complementary to the role of advocacy organizations, which is no less essential to improve the protection of victims of armed conflict. It is ICRC's ambition, though, through its constant engagement with states, to calibrate the light, right level of ambition and audacity to keep the equilibrist balanced on the high rope. This is my vision, ladies and gentlemen, for the ICRC and my understanding of the rule of law. On the one hand, implementation of what is already established in the law, and on the other hand, transformation when it is commanded by what Frederick Martins, the famous Russian delegate at the Hague Conference of 1899 would call, and I quote, the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. I thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for the kind words uh, uh, towards a uh, professor of St. Petersburg University, Professor Martins. Uh, in the recent decades, the whole world has been watching uh, closely the strong growth of the economies of BRICS. Uh, some people were watching this with some tension uh, in mind. Uh, we all understand that um, if something is wrong about the economies, uh, then laws are, are at fault, and the lawyers uh, who wrote uh, uh, such laws. But what if the economies develop? So I now would like to give the floor to the Chief Justice of India, uh, Rajendra Malo. Lotka, please, sir, the floor is yours. Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Minister of Justice, ladies and gentlemen, it is in many ways fitting that we are gathered in St. Petersburg to discuss and think about the future of the rule of law. As the city of three revolutions in the early 20th century, and as a city that survived a brutal siege lasting nearly 872 days during the Second World War, St. Petersburg is a city of change and tremendous resilience. Similarly, the rule of law as a political and legal concept has undergone tremendous change in meaning and faced significant challenges through the years. And yet, societies and legal systems of the world either repeatedly invoke it as a guiding principle or in places where it has proven difficult to establish it continues to be a cherished aspiration. During the next few minutes, I intend to map certain common experiences and challenges concerning the rule of law in our globalizing world on what areas the rule of law will impact in future and what problems its implementation will face. The constitutions of many countries encapsulate the formal components of rule of law, namely separation of powers, primacy of law and constitution, equality in law, judicial independence and review, limitation of state power by law, protection of human rights, etc. But these are seen as a goal to strive for rather than realizing them. The stark contradiction 
between the constitutional spirit and the ground realities undermine the efficacy of rule of law. If there should be one focal point of efforts, it is implementing successfully the rule of law. I do believe, as argued by theorists like Lone Fuller and John Finnis, that the rule of law cannot merely be a formal concept and it must necessarily provide for some transcendent rights and adhere to a bare minimum of natural law values. Advancement of rule of law at the national and international levels is essential for sustained and inclusive economic growth, sustainable development, and the eradication of poverty and hunger. The concept of judicial review has perhaps received the widest acceptance in globe in terms of ideas associated with rule of law. Nearly 160 out of approximately 192 constitutional systems in the world have some sort of judicial review built in. Of course, even with these systems of judicial review, there is wide variance. On one end of the spectrum, we have courts like the UK Supreme Court that can only declare legislations to be incompatible with the UK Human Rights Act, but not strike them down. But on the other hand, we have the Indian Supreme Court, which can not only annul the law enacted by the parliament and state legislatures, but can also invoke the basic structure doctrine to strike down even amendments in the Constitution. There would be no go in saying which of these systems are more desirable as that would be a largely futile discussion. The trajectories of constitutional review across legal systems are necessarily a product of the circumstances within which the rule of law institutions operate. The Indian Supreme Court's basic structure doctrine might have no relevance for European democracies, but it has found explicit favor with the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, while the Supreme Court of Pakistan has adopted a version that is similar in many ways. At the same time, we have seen its explicit rejection from other apex courts in the regions like those in Sri Lanka and Malaysia. We could debate endlessly whether it was normatively legitimate for the Indian Supreme Court to curb Parliament's power to amend the Constitution. However, the more important question to think about would be the manner in which the doctrine has operated to maintain a rule of law society in India and compare it with the experience of other legal systems. As these developments have taken place in South Asia, we have also seen the emergence of European Court of Human Rights to ensure that the 47 member countries of the Council of Europe adhere to the protections contained in the European Convention of Human Rights. This exercise in harmonizing rights, protection across legal systems of different countries has been far from smooth and has demonstrated to us the possibilities and perils of evolving a homogenized global version of the rule of law. We would be ill-advised not to learn from the experience of other legal systems, but that learning must be circumscribed and influenced by contexts within which institutions operate. One of the most urgent questions facing legal system across the world is the obligation of the governments in protecting the socio-economic rights of its population. The International Commission of Jurists in Delhi Declaration in 1959 recognized the rule of law to be dynamic concept which should be employed not only to safeguard civil and political rights, but also to establish social, economic, educational, and cultural conditions under which 
and individual's legitimate aspirations and dignity may be realized, I do recognize that the recognition and enforcement of socio-economic rights is alien to many legal systems, but I do believe that it is a question that courts and governments across will have to grapple with increasingly. The jurisprudence emanating from the Supreme Court of India and South African Constitutional Court have taken a lead on this, rights to education, health, food, housing, work, etc., are all matters that are increasingly under stress in the globalizing world of ours. Integration of markets has, lot, has led to a lot of benefits, but it also brought many vulnerabilities to the fore. Once again, I must highlight at this juncture that the Indian and South African courts have dealt with the issue of enforcing socio-economic rights quite differently, while Supreme Court of India has used the right to life within Article 21 of Indian Constitution to read in socio-economic rights. South Africa, of course, has explicit constitutional provisions that recognize the rights to housing, education, healthcare, food, water, and social security. Free market depends on certain institutions and the enforcement of rules, such as freedom of contract and enforcement of contracts. From a purely economic development perspective, the presence and quality of institutions has been found to have an intrinsic link to development through property law, incentives, and trade relations. The rule of law is associated by economists with economic benefit, including growth. It has been considered crucial by the United Nations and in international dialogue as a goal to strive for the developing nations to achieve also parallel objectives of better access to justice and enforcement of rights. Economic and technological forces have profoundly changed our world, but like with all change, it is impossible to characterize all of it as good or bad. Such global integration has given rise to huge challenges for nation states across the globe and legal systems must respond to those challenges. Our response cannot be watering down rule of law protections. It must instead be to further bolster those protections. If we fail to do that, we run a very high risk of undermining the legitimacy of rule of law. Even in societies which are largely democratic, there is abundance of corruption and threats to democratic processes. Rule of law implementation would need that its transposition does not only hold true today but also tomorrow. Maintaining institutions capable of sustaining the rule of law whose functioning does not depend solely on the current system or persons in charge but can withstand the challenge and establishing institutions where they do not exist for effective rule of law are the biggest challenge posed before us. The problem of internal and external extremist violence has plagued India for more than two decades now. Much of the world is also increasingly familiar with such threats to national security, but the response of governments has been a cause of concern. Post 9 by 11, we have seen a tremendous rise in anti-terror laws across the world and seek to give more power to the executive, especially law enforcement agencies. The trend, more or less, has been, has been that our attempt to achieve national security has come coupled with a trend towards lesser accountability and transparency. To be sure, we need to secure the life and liberty of persons within our borders, but we cannot do so by eroding the constitutional protections contained within our constitutions. 
India is largest democracy in the world. Recently, it had parliamentary elections with a population of 1.28 billion and 8,800 80 million eligible voters, adult franchise being the constitutional norm, 660 million voters cast their votes, and within 24 hours, with the help of electronic voting machines, the elections were successful, 540 seats of parliament were filled, and the transfer of power was smooth. India has very strong institutional framework. Its judiciary is very strong. It has primacy over appointments to the Supreme Court judges, the High Court Chief Justices, High Court judges. Uh, its institutions like election, of com uh, commission, election Commission of India uh, is totally independent and remains uninfluenced by any extraneous consideration. We have, perhaps, uh, you may be surprised to know, unfortunately, about 30 million cases pending in the judicial courts with a judicial strength of about 1,890 judges right from the Chief Justice of India the, to the lowest judicial officer. We have invented alternative dispute resolution mechanism of courts, arbitration, mediation, and negotiation. They are common, and they are being used by many countries. But we have adopted a new method of Lok Adalat, which is a people's court, public court, whereby pending cases can be immediately sent, and so also proposed litigation and in a very informal manner, cases are decided. On 23rd November 2013, we had a national local dalat, and you'll be surprised to know, on one single day, 70 million cases were decided. Settled amicably between the parties Every party that want, went out of the forum was fully satisfied. Well, it is difficult to measure the benefits or effect of rule of law, as in theory, it is difficult to construct a measure of the rule of law, and in practice, it is difficult to gather the data. Yet, new indices, such as those introduced by the various projects, including wide range of criterion, could assist governments in getting a realistic picture of rule of law. I thank you, Minister of Justice, for giving me an opportunity uh, to speak to this distinguished gathering. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lodha. Today, among the plenary speakers, uh, we have a representative of one of the most prestigious legal schools, law schools of the world, uh, Professor Michel Grimaldi. is a professor of the legal department at uh, the Pantheon Assas University. He specializes in private law. His books uh, are known the world over. They serve as everyday reference to many, many lawyers, and I'm sure that many of you have these books and use them. I know, Professor, that your books are just as popular among uh, professors at my university, and uh, it is very fitting indeed, uh, because uh, Professor Grimaldi sticks to the positivist concept of law, which uh, seems to be highly popular among uh, scholars and professors at the St. Petersburg State University. Therefore, we're certainly looking forward to hearing an opinion of uh, such a high level law and scholar. What approaches to the development of uh, a legal system, in your opinion, are best suited today if we want to address uh, the current challenges societies and countries are facing all over the world? Please, over to you.
Monsieur le Premier ministre, Monsieur le ministre de la Justice, Mr. Prime Minister, Minister of Justice, I would like to begin by thanking you for the honor that has been accorded to me when I was selected to be one of the plenary speakers at this uh, very well organized forum. I was asked to share with you my thoughts about uh, civil law from the standpoint of a law-based state as well as the rule of law principle. However, whenever we talk about rule of law, we also need to talk about uh, the particular attributes of legislation because apart from the dictatorship regime where legislation acts as uh, a threat of punishment, in a democratic society, it is supposed to have attributes that will be accepted by all the citizens. So, a law-based, uh, rule-based state is not a threat or coercion. It has to do with the quality of an authority that is friendly towards the citizens. Um, Mr. President, you cited Rousseau, who said that uh, people should love the law. So let's talk about civil law, sometimes called the Roman Germanic law or continental law. This uh, is a very long-standing tradition which goes back to the Roman law tradition. It is a culture that was inspired by a series of codifications uh, late in the 18th century. And uh, by the way, here in St. Petersburg, under Catherine II, uh, those codifications took place as well. A very important milestone, a point of departure, was the 1804 Napoleonic Code, which uh, gradually became widespread all over Europe, uh, Latin America, and even impacted some Asian countries along the way. Continental or civil law today represents two-thirds of the global population, 13 out of 20 uh, biggest um, economic powers and 7 out of 10 high-income countries in terms of the income per capita. Very generally, the whole world can be divided into uh, civil law and to other legal systems such as common law. Uh, the common law systems span uh, almost all the English-speaking countries. Uh, so what are the advantages of continental law that uh, support uh, the rule of law principle? Continental law is uh, note two aspects usually. One of them is access or accessibility of uh, law under civil law system as also the balance of law that is also widely discussed. The accessibility of continental law it goes back to the very roots, its very origin, because from the very beginning it was codified in various codes, such as the Trade Code, the Code of Civil Procedure, and Civil Code, whereas common law is based on precedents on rulings made by various judiciary bodies that are then entered into case books or legal compilations, uh, such as the famous restatements in the United States. This difference in sources uh, entails difference in uh, content. Continental law has to do with general impersonal law, whereas uh, co common law has to do with uh, specific uh, rulings by courts. For, for instance, uh, uh, the overcoming of discrimination of uh, towards men and women in the French law, uh, that refers to some of the most important laws of uh, trade law, family law, and uh, elections law. In the US, uh, this is codified by uh, Supreme Court rulings. Uh, as a continental uh, jurist, I believe that uh, law, codification of law makes it more materially and intellectually accessible. It is more materially accessible because the legal norms uh, are very easy to uh, disseminate in the population. They exist in the form of uh, a law. They do not have to be derived from court rulings. Uh, they're also intellectually accessible because these law, legal norms uh, are 
presented in pedestrian language, in very general wording. Uh, they are not presented in the form of complicated and context-dependent decisions. Uh, then there is also an element of predictability for the lawyers, and that ensures legal security. This is why Many of the emerging economies these days uh, are trying to adopt uh, a number of legislation, including codes, uh, investment codes, uh, bearing this in mind, because we have never seen such an, in, such an overwhelming number of uh, codes and codification as we are seeing today in the context of globalization. Another aspect, there is a balance between various, among various values uh, that the law should embody and promote uh, under common law. In those systems, uh, heavy emphasis is laid on protecting the economic freedoms. By contrast, the continental law tries to balance economic efficiency with social justice. The social factors as well as moral considerations are just as important in continental law as the uh, economic ones. This is why there are mechanisms of regulation in place uh, under the continental law system. These mechanisms a priori uh, govern relationships in areas where common law leaves uh, everything to um, the free market forces and acts a posteriori um, through judges that make rulings. Uh, let, us go, let us remember now the subprime crisis, which has demonstrated not only um, economic uh, disasters that happened, but also a lot of human tragedies that were then regulated after the fact. This is why, in some sense, Continental law is a form of an agreement. This is an arrangement that uh, factors in the interests of every party, whereas uh, if we look at the common law systems, uh, in those systems, the emphasis uh, is on the economic transactions. And yes, indeed, uh, common law is fraught with a number of issues that are simply unheard of in continental law. This is why provision of legal services is not considered in continental law as uh, a commercial type of provision. For that particular reason, we for instance, in all the Latin American uh, law countries have the notary institutes, institutions. Um, no, the notaries uh, act as uh, government or state authorized agents to produce various uh, legal uh, transactions and acts. Uh, at this stage, uh, I would like to clarify a little bit what I have just uh, said to provide more detail uh, because uh, this uh, overview of continental, view, uh, continental law does not address a number of nuances. Yes, we understand that continent, the continental law countries are far from being a miracle in terms of their achievements, but uh, when we think back to our roots, uh, think about the need of uh, predictability and stability, we need to say that, just as uh, Mr. Minister uh, said uh, about Argentina, we recognize that uh, continental law should be codified through a number of uh, legislative reforms. Reforms, unfortunately, sometimes are carried out without uh, having a global vision in mind. They disregard a number of factors. Our continental law is uh, being uh, is impacting the development of human rights also because a simple declaration of human rights uh, does not create a legal standard. What it does is uh, it simply proclaims a guarantee of a right. However, it does not contain any reference to the particular content of the right or the mechanisms that should be in place to enforce those rights. Whenever human rights are declared, 
dans un règlement successoral, in, uh, dans un contractuel. Uh, various uh, private matters, in matters of inheritance or in some other matters, it is up to the judge to act as an umpire to decide on the protection of human rights. And for some people, it uh, means a drift towards common law. This is something that we observe in the case law of a number of judiciary bodies. Whenever we talk about the need to balance the economic, moral, and social considerations and values, uh, this chase uh, uh, for benefits uh, may sometimes uh, sacrifice civil order in favor of uh, trade order. And yes, indeed, sometimes uh, uh, the that trend goes a little bit overboard. The pursuit of uh, economic benefits uh, sometimes fails to create very important safeguards for our citizens. Bearing that in mind, I think we could also say that uh, some common law representatives uh, might even say that, well, we have advantages of our own. But what we observe is uh, uh, the common law countries do have uh, certain attributes and characteristics that were received, uh, borrowed from the continental law system. So let me clarify here a little bit uh, what I mean and where I'm coming from here. I'm not really saying that one system has any mm, uh, preeminence over the other. Uh, what I think is that different countries should uh, maintain legal cultures that uh, meet uh, their legal awareness and their traditions. I do believe that the U.S. love uh, their legal system that also has certain advantages uh, in the same way as continental law has. Uh, and uh, luckily, we're in a good position to borrow some of the best legal practices from each other. For instance, take the U.K. The U.K. may <coughs> borrow useful elements from uh, civil law, Whereas um, certain common law elements have been incorporated uh, in the continental law systems. Uh, one should not overlook the national traditions uh, because they are important naturally. Then we also observe. Um, attempts to impose certain elements, uh, just as the World Bank does uh, when it uh, imposes conditionality on its loans uh, in the form of uh, various reforms, reforms that are transplanted from other places. Sometimes, uh, People talk about uh, the uh, need for uniformity, but one size does not fit all. I'm sorry for my English here. Globalization and economic development should not uh, result in the leveling down of cultures. Yes, indeed, uh, human rights are universal in nature, but uh, the a French citizen who purchases a land plot has to have a guarantee that uh, they have land security, whereas for the U.S. citizen, it is enough to have a piece of insurance. Uh, that would be a sufficient guarantee for a Swiss citizen. On the other hand, when they enter into a marriage, uh, they have to go to a notary to get their advice, uh, whereas for a U.S. For a, for a US uh, couple to be, it's just uh, uh, necessary to get uh, to make a contract in the presence of a lawyer, whereas uh, the Chinese or Japanese uh, might be a little bit surprised by some of the legal uh, traditions of Europe, where because they are rooted in the Confucian tradition, which talks about children being children being obedient to their parents. I think by now, dear colleagues, you already understand uh, the main message that I am trying to put across here. I simply want to say that, yes, continental law has a number of advantages, 
that really make us stand out, and I do believe that our countries will continue to maintain this legal culture. I believe uh, that the St. Petersburg Legal Forum has uh, provided ample evidence to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Grimaldi. Uh, it's our fourth forum. Consistently, representatives of the Hague Conference for um, Private International Law have been participants here. It's an oldest and most important international organization in the PIL area. Their goal is to create effective legal mechanisms allowing for relationship between citizens of different nations. Another goal is to develop a single set of approaches to the issues of um, occasional conflicts between national laws and jurisdictions. I'd like to give the floor to Secretary General of the Hague Conference for Private International Law, Christoph Bernasconi. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Prime Minister, Minister of Justice, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, May I, at the outset, first thank the organizers for having invited the Hague Conference to join this panel and to express a few comments on the concept of rule of law from a private international perspective, naturally. If I may, let me start by recalling the obvious, but which at the same time is the very foundation of this impressive and important international legal forum, which brings us together here in this beautiful city of St. Petersburg. We live in the age of globalization, the age of growing interconnectedness of communities and people all over the world. We see an amazing ongoing process of compression of distances of cross-border investment, trade and commerce, of expanding markets, of growing mobility of people, and of instant sharing of information through the mass media and the internet. One aspect of this process that is still often underestimated is that globalization occurs in a context of legal diversity. The transnational relationships and transactions that move globalization forward occur in a context where each state, and sometimes even each unit within a state, has its own rules to govern civil and commercial legal matters. The result, perhaps surprisingly, is that globalization perpetuates the dramatic impact of diverse legal systems on all transactions and relationships now less constrained by traditional geographic and political boundaries. As people and commerce increase their connections to the wider world beyond their local communities, there is an ever-growing need for a system to address the inevitable legal questions which arise. As these activities are subject to the laws and rules of multiple jurisdictions, there is clearly an ever-growing need for the development of a particular sort of the rule of law, for the rule of private international law. <coughs> Notice that private international law does not address the harmonization of diverse legal systems or adoption of uniform laws. Instead, Private international law questions can be categorized into four areas, jurisdiction, applicable law, recognition and enforcement of judgments, and international cooperation, which are at the very heart of any cross-border civil and commercial relationship or transaction. Instead of seeking to harmonize different legal systems, private international law is unique in that it generally aims to respect the diversity of legal systems and their underlying culture, while at the same time building bridges between these different legal systems so that they can coexist and provide the user, be it a practitioner, a judge, an in-house counsel, or the ordinary citizen, 
with clear guidance, a road sign as to where to go and which law to apply. Private international law is therefore a key component in global governance. While a state may, for example, provide for recognition of foreign judgments or allow the use of foreign official documents, it cannot independently guarantee recognition of its own judgments, public documents, or other acts in another country. A central goal of private international law is precisely to facilitate this by removing legal obstacles to efficient and effective state-to-state -state cooperation and establishing procedural norms to govern the outcome of legal questions relating to cross-border matters. The ultimate objective, in other words, is to establish a system that provides individuals and commercial entities engaged in cross-border activities with a predictable legal framework to govern and resolve their transactions and disputes with each other irrespective of national boundaries and differences between legal systems. Private and international law, in essence, is designed to ensure that in their dealings with the government and each other, individuals and other entities know the rules of the game, know in advance what legal regime is applicable to their cross-border situation or transaction. As a result, all stakeholders are able to enjoy, enjoy a certain level of legal certainty and predictability. By encouraging cross-border transactions through multilateral instruments, as opposed to do so merely in a domestic context, private international law may also encourage economic progress and prosperity in developing countries, especially those lacking the legal and transactional infrastructure necessary to participate fully and efficiently in the modern global economy. Such states, which often have little experience in private international law matters and lack the necessary legal infrastructure to participate actively and effectively in the globalized economy or negotiate favorable bilateral agreements governing relations with other states, in such instances, they would normally be at a severe disadvantage to attracting international trade, investment, and capital markets. Instead, however, the development of a universally accepted system of norms and procedures ensures that these states are able to access tools likely to facilitate participation in the global economy. All of this was well known to experts from a small group of pioneering states including the Russian Empire, that gathered in the Netherlands at the brink of the 20th century, in 1893 to be precise, to lay the groundwork for the development of multilateral instruments to facilitate international legal cooperation. In 1893, the Tsar Nicholas II sent his legal advisor, Fyodor Martens, to The Hague to take part in this first meeting under the auspices of the Hague Conference to discuss and negotiate a series of forward-looking treaties to reduce the very same obstacles facing citizens in cross-border situations. The Tsar and Martens were actually strong support supporters of the Hague Conference project. The foundations of the Hague Conference are thus also in St. Petersburg, where Martens taught at the university. I had the privilege the other day of visiting St. Petersburg University, and the dean of the law faculty explained to me that Martens was almost kicked out of the university because of all his involvement in these international activities, so that he couldn't keep up with his teaching obligations. I think they were wise in keeping him. The Hague Conference was born from these discussions. Since then, it has developed and adopted an impressive number of conventions which harmonize private international law at the global level. Several of these treaties are in force for more than 60, 90, or even more than 100 states from all over the world. The Hague Conventions thus contribute to a supranational system to support transporter flows of trade, capital, people, and ideas. 
a supranational system which facilitates the effective settlement of disputes, the well-being of families and children, and simplified rules governing the recognition of foreign documents, evidence, or civil procedure. More efficient, transparent, and predictable governance, that is, adherence to the rule of law, which reduces risk, provides stability, and leads to economic development. In many respects, private international law res represents the future development of transnational legal mechanisms and principles. Frequently perceived incorrectly as a musty set of doctrinal principles rooted in 19th century European doctrine and jurisprudence, it is, in fact, a dynamic and rapidly evolving field of direct relevance to sophisticated lawyers working in a broad spectrum of international and transnational contexts. Over the years, decades, and indeed centuries, the Hague Conference has grown into a truly global organization. 144 states from around the world are today connected to its work by being a party to at least one of the many, 38 in total, Hague Conventions adopted. 25 states and the European Union are actual members of the organization. And these figures keep rising, thereby emphasizing the continuing, indeed growing, importance of the mandate and the work of the Hague Conference in the shadow of globalization. We count on the active support of all our members, including, of course, Russia, to help further the mission of the Hague Conference, develop the private international law component of the rule of law, protect children involved in cross-border abductions or adoptions, provide businesses with the legal certainty and predictability that they need to make their deals, improve systems of cooperation and communication between states to reduce potential challenges to effective international civil or administrative procedures. The mission of the Hague Conference is more than ever relevant. Never has the world been so interconnected. Never have cross-border relationships, private or commercial, be so dominant. Never has the need for the private international law component of the rule of law been so important. The St. Petersburg Forum demonstrates that Russia continues to be at the core of international legal developments. The Forum provides a unique opportunity for a broad range of international legal experts from all over the world to share legal developments in almost any area of the law. It not only provides a chance to all of us to come together, but to collectively look towards the future. Given the number and diversity of topics on the program, which directly related to the current work of the Hague Conference, we have been very pleased to take an active part in this fourth edition of the Forum, just like we proudly participated in all previous editions. We are very grateful to the organizers for their kind invitation. Globalization will continue expanding into new areas, new activities, new relationships, and new ways of doing business. Coordinating the practices, procedures, and rules among a broad range of diverse legal systems is therefore in every nation's interest and has ever become necessary for daily transactional exchanges to work. The Hague Conference strives to ensure the universal availability and relevance of its instruments to the entire global community. To do this, we must continue our work with states to continually improve existing conventions while still developing new solutions. This depends on the steady and hopefully further increasing support of existing and new members and increases in state ratifications and accessions to Hague Conventions. The result will be an enhanced system of cooperation among states. Eventually, progress towards this end will also lead to universal benefits for individuals and businesses who are still adjusting to globalization. 
by building bridges between legal systems, nations, and indeed people, by providing the relevant road signs showing the way private international law contributes in its very own way to the fostering of the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernasconi. Uh, Mr. Martins was skipping a lot of classes. And maybe that was when uh, in Russia the attitude to students uh, changed. The professor was not kicked out. And then they realized that it was inappropriate to kick out students for skipping classes. So it marked a new milestone in the university life of uh, Russia. I know there's a question of Professor Moorer. Uh, if if uh, you want, Professor, you may take it. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I received a question. Uh, what is your opinion about the situation with thousands of refugees uh, from Ukraine coming to uh, Russia? What are you going to do about this situation? What are your real practical steps and measures to support these people? With regard to uh, the situation in Ukraine, which is not fundamentally different from uh, what ICRC is encountering in many conflicts of the world, we have always an effort to be as close as possible to conflict and to the origin of displacement and to prevent that even those movements emerge. So according to ICRC's mandate, we have considerably increased over the past couple of months our presence in Ukraine in order to engage with all armed actors on the ground in eastern Ukraine to comply with international humanitarian law and also to beef up, to increase our humanitarian work in eastern Ukraine in order to prevent people from having to flee the situation in which they found themselves. This is what is the core of ICRC's mandate. Our mandate is not so much with refugees, those who cross borders, but it is also true that upon requests from government, we would, of course, try to respond to needs which are uh, to, to, refugee, to, to refugee needs. This is, for instance, what is happening in the Middle East, what is not happening at the present moment in the context of refugees coming from uh, Ukraine to Russia. In the Middle East, for instance, we have not only deployed a considerable program in Syria, but we have also supported, upon their requests, the governments of Lebanon and Jordan and Iraq to deal with hum the humanitarian impact of refugees coming to their countries, and we do this in strong cooperation with the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees. So, to, be, to make it short, ICRC's involvement is always a mix between our mandate to assist and protect people, our wish to prevent migration, and the license to operate we have from the high contracting parties of the Geneva Convention, or to put it in other words, whether there is a concrete request and uh, a wish that ICRC uh, uh, should, sh should respond to a humanitarian problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, I would like to thank all the participants of the plenary session. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, would you like to say a few words? Well, I believe that the most important in such sessions is to get away in time, or on time, sorry. 
Otherwise, all the words that have been said will have an opposite effect on us. But in my turn, I'd like to express the words of gratitude to all my colleagues who have gathered here on this stage, to Mr. Alag, to Mr. Benasconi, to Mr. Grimaldi, to Mr. Lodha, to Mr. Maurer, and to you, Nikolai, for such accurate managing and moderating of our discussion. And the end of our discussion testifies to the fact that Mr. Maurer was mentioning all of us are lawyers and all of us who are present in this hall, even if we are dealing with the theoretical issues of the legal problems and if we are dealing with practical issues Im implementation of laws, we are all part of political life tissue. And the rule of law is, I believe, a value which unites a huge amount of people of our profession in the world today. We are all speaking the same legal language. It's doesn't, it doesn't matter what legal family we are in, Roman, German, or Anglo-Saxon, it doesn't matter. We have similar values, and this gives me hope that a lot of conflicts and difficulties which all the world has faced today, I believe that all those problems will be resolved with the help of our joint actions. Thank you for your participation in the forum. Ladies and gentlemen, the plenary session is declared closed. Thank you.